Hello. Today we're solving this physics paper. May June 2021, variant 1 3. This is the last paper in the series. Let's begin. Before that, let's talk about the threshold. Give me a second. So, for this paper, a was surprisingly at 30. A was at 30, B was at 25, C was at 21, E was at 18, sorry, D was at 18, and E was at 15. So the thing with easier papers is that, since this was quite easy, A star was probably at 35, do you understand? So for an easier paper, it's harder to get an A star actually. Okay, Let's begin, starting with question number one. What is the, what is the reasonable estimate of the kinetic energy of an Olympic athlete running in a 100 meter race? Okay, so, Basically, think about it. Kinetic energy is half mv square. The average mass is around 70, 65 to 70. Let's just uh, consider it to be 65. Half into 65, and the velocity should be around 10, 10 square, right? 10, 11, something like that. So 10 square into 65 into 0.5. That gives us a value of around 3,250. So the closest answer is 4,000, right? What is the unit of momentum? Momentum is mv, mass into velocity, okay? Or force is the rate of change of momentum. So momentum is actually force into time. So it's Newton seconds, right? So two is also c. Three, what is the horizontal component of the force shown? It's going to be 20 cos 53, okay? So 20 cos 53 is 12, a, 3a. Now, the diagram shows two readings on a micrometer. What is the difference between the two readings? Interesting. So, this one is actually 11, 12, 13. Okay, 13. And this one is at um, 1, 1.5, right? This is 1.5. So, reading 2 is actually 11, 12, 13. 13 plus, this is at 46, right? 13 plus 46 into 0 0.01 46 into 0 0.01 plus 13 that's actually 13.46 what about uh, reading 1? it's at 1 1.5 plus how much is this? 12 right? 12 into 0 0.01 12 into 0 0.01 plus uh, 1.5 that's 1.62 1.62. So 1.62 and 13.46. Let's subtract. 13.46 millimeters minus 1.62 millimeters. 13.46 minus 1.62. That gives us a value of 11.84. I'm getting B. 4 is B. 5. The diameter of a circular disc is measured as 7 plus minus 0.1 meter. millimeter. What is the area of the disc and the absolute uncertainty? So area is pi d squared by 4, right? So area is equal to pi. In millimeter square, it's 7 squared by 4. So 7 square by 4 into pi is 38. Okay, it's going to be 38-ish. Now the uncertainty. Remember, pi and 4 are constants. So del A by A is, since there's a square, it's going to come in front 2 del D by D, right? So del A is actually equal to 2 times 0.1 by 7 into the area we just found out as 38.48. 38.4845, right? This into 2 into 0.1 by 7 gives us a value of del A is equal to 1.09956. Uncertainty, absolute uncertainty will always be 1 SF. So it's just 1 millimeter square. So our answer should be like this. It was 38.5, but we should round it off to the significant figure that our absolute uncertainty signifies, okay? So it's going to be 30. Think about it. It was, wait. It was 38.4845, 
but our uncertainty is plus minus 1, right? So we should write it as 38 plus minus 1. Answer B, 5B. 6. The diagram shows the velocity time graph for a car. What is the dist distance traveled in the first 4 seconds? So it's the area under the car, the graph, right? It's the trapezium. So it's 2 over here and 12 over here, right? So half into 2 plus 12. Half into 2 plus 12 into the height of the trapezium. That's 4. 2 plus 12 into 4 into 0.5 gives us a value of 28 meters. 6 is D. 7. A steel ball is dropped from rest from a height h above the ground. The ball hits the ground after time t. This is repeated for a number of different heights. The graph shows the variation of h with t square. The gradient of the graph is g. Which expression gives the acceleration of the ball? Interesting. It's dropped from rest. s is equal to ut plus half at square. Okay. Or h is equal to 0 plus half into a t square. h is equal to half a t square. Now look at it. The gradient of the graph is actually h by t square, right? So I'm going to try to bring h by t square here. h by t square is equal to half times a. So g is equal to half times a or a is equal to twice the gradient, right? That's why 7 should be C. Hopefully that makes sense. 8. Two masses, capital M and small m, are connected by an inextensible spring, a string, sorry, which passes over a frictionless pulley. Mass m rests on a frictionless slope as shown. The slope is at an angle theta to the horizontal. The two masses are initially held stationary and then released. Mass m accelerates down the slope. Okay, so this is clearly heavier. Which expression must be correct? So this one goes up, right? Although there's a weight below. So this tension is clearly greater than the weight. On the other hand here, this is a frictionless slope, right? Tension is trying to pull object M above, but the component of weight, right? The component of weight, which is mg sine theta, okay? mg sine theta is actually greater than tension or it wouldn't be falling down do you understand md sin theta is greater than tension okay md sin theta is greater than tension so how can we um how can we correlate this how can we correlate this with the question? Let's try. Basically, we know that mg sine theta, sorry, we know that mg sine theta minus tension is equal to ma. And on the other hand, we also know that tension minus mg is equal to ma. So we can get rid of these. And mg sine theta minus mg is equal to m plus ma. Okay. Now what? This is an expression that we uh, usually find out um, in m1. Now here's the logic, right? So you can take g common, m sine theta minus m is equal to m plus m a. By the way, since it is falling down in this direction, this acceleration will be a positive value, by the way, okay? If the acceleration is positive in the direction down the slope, okay? So m sine theta minus m is equal to m plus m into a by g, okay, m plus m by a by g. Now, here's the interesting part. So, this this value over here, right, the one you see on the right, it's a positive value, right? So, we can say that m sine theta minus m is actually 
greater than zero okay or since it's a positive value i just told you guys because m is falling down the slope so m sine theta is greater than small m or sine theta is greater than m by capital m that's how we get our answer c eight is c eight nine the weights and masses of four different objects on the surface of four different plants are shown which plant has the lowest value of acceleration of free fall okay let's find out the value of acceleration of free fall we know that w is equal to mg g is equal to w by m let's do it so for this one it's going to be 40 into 10 to the power minus 3 40 into 10 to the power minus 3 divided by 6 into 10 to the power minus 3 all units have to be newton and kg <laughs> okay so we're getting a value of 6.67 this one 3 by 500 into 10 to the power minus 3 right 500 into 10 to the power minus 3 3 divided by answer that's actually a 6 now this 10 by 1 it's just 10 this one 2600 by 750 2600 by 750 gives us a value of 3.47 I'm gonna go with D 9d 10 a rock in deep space is traveling towards a distant star and collides with a stationary spacecraft what is not a possible outcome of the collision okay so basically there's a rock here it's going it's traveling towards the distant star and collides with the stationary spacecraft over here okay so our rock right it was moving towards the spacecraft so after collision what can happen there are a few cases like after collision the rock can move in the opposite direction and the spacecraft can move in the right to the right okay now there's another scenario where the rock becomes stationary and the spacecraft moves to the right however this can never happen like the rock becomes stationary and the spacecraft moves to the left this is totally impossible because we had momentum to the right initially right so at the end we should have to conserve momentum we should only have momentum to the right it can't be to the left only that's the logic why am i saying this because look at a the rock becomes stationary and the spacecraft moves towards the star this is fine I'll tell you why look at this now this is our star this was the scenario I was talking about when the rock hits it becomes stationary and the spacecraft moves towards the star now the rock moves away from the star and so does the spacecraft they're saying that after collision right after collision both of them move away from the star this is totally impossible this doesn't make sense B is wrong okay a steel ball is falling at a constant terminal speed in steel air the forces acting on the ball are upthrust viscous drag and weight what is the order of increasing magnitude of these three forces you need to understand guys we are moving at terminal velocity okay weight is always the highest always weight is always the highest right now up thrust tends to be a very small value okay because it doesn't really change it always remains constant but why does viscous drag increase remember viscous drag has a relation with speed as you increase your speed over time viscous drag the value the magnitude of viscous drag also increases okay so viscous this is viscous drag and this is your up thrust so it's like weight highest then viscous drag then the up thrust according to that the answer should be a okay the answer should be a Understood? Up thrust is the least, followed by viscous drag, then weight. What is a couple? A couple is basically a pair of equal forces acting in not the same direction. Pair of forces that are equal and opposite. Equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, but acting along 
different lines. This is true. This is basically a couple, okay? Something like this. Five. Five. Perfect. Thirteen. Four coplanar forces act on a rigid rod as shown. The rod is hinged at P. Which force produces the greatest moment? Okay, let's look at this. This is ten into one. Ten. Okay, what about this? This is six sine thirty into two, right? Six sine thirty into two. So that's six only. This is only six. Okay, next. Two into three, right? 2 into 3 which is 6 also what about this this is 4 sine 30 into a distance of 4 4 sine 30 into 4 is 8 so clearly 13 is a the one at the beginning was the highest at 10 newton meter a book of weight w has a rectangular shape and is of uniform thickness the book is held in a vertical plane so that the longer sides of the book are vertical as shown. Which expression gives the approximate torque exerted by the hand on the book? <laughs> Try to understand. This is a tricky question. Basically, this is the book, okay? The book actually tries to fall down. It has a weight, right? It actually has a weight which acts through the geometric center because it's uniform, rectangular, uniform thickness. Now the logic is, this is the weight, right? Where is the pivot actually? You can think of the pivot here, right? The pivot is here. So the perpendicular distance is actually A by 2. So, the book, right, it is actually trying to fall down. It's trying to become like this. So, what is this movement? This is anticlockwise movement. So, there is anticlockwise movement of A by 2 into W or W A by 2. However, it is kept in place by the hand. So, to prevent this anticlockwise movement from occurring, what must the hand provide? A clockwise movement of the same magnitude. Okay, so it should be a clockwise moment of the same magnitude W A by 2. That's why 4 should be A. The book is trying to provide, the weight of the book is trying to provide a W A by 2 anticlockwise moment, but our hand is providing this, a clockwise moment, okay? Now 15, the derivation of the pressure equation uses a number of relationships between quantities, which is not used. Okay. So, we don't use this B. This is not used. Okay. We don't use uh, MGH. How does the what was the formula for derivation for pressure again? It was like this. Remember, we had an object that was immersed in water, basically. That was the logic. And we wanted to find out the pressure exerted at a certain height. Now, this pressure, right, it refers to this liquid. So, pressure is equal to H rho G. And we know that density is equal to mass by volume. And pressure is equal to force by area. So the liquid above the surface of the block was actually providing a pressure on that surface, this cross-sectional area, right? So we know that pressure is equal to force by area, right? Now what? We know that density equals to mass by volume. And mass is equal to density into volume, right? So pressure is equal to the weight of water is mg by the cross-section area. Now mg can be written as rho into volume into g by area. And next what? Rho into volume can be written as 
cross section area into length into g by a and we can get rid of a and we ultimately end up with rho hg or rho lg okay so we use density equals to mass by volume we use pressure equals to force by area and we also use weight is equal to mg right Moving on to the next one, 16. A spring is initially neither compressed nor extended. No energy is stored in the spring. A force can be applied so that it is either compressed or extended. What is the change in EP? This was a trick question. Both compression and extension actually increases the elastic potential stored in the spring. A sample of gas is sealed in a cylinder by a piston. The frictionless piston is free to move, so the pressure of the gas remains constant. The gas initially occupies a volume of this, and it does 14.4 joules of work. So the volume is actually increased, for the volume increases, okay? So we know that the work done by gas is P del V, pressure must be constant. 14.4 is equal to the pressure, 1.80 into 10 power 5 into the change in volume, okay? Final volume minus 2.40 into 10 to the power minus 4. Solve this. 14.4 divided by 1.8 into 10 to the power 5. Okay. Plus 2.4 into 10 to the power minus 4. That gives us a value of 3.2 into 10 to the power minus 4. Okay. So I'm going to go with C. And 17 is in fact C. 18. A car of mass 500 kg is at rest at point X on a slope as shown. The car's brakes are released and the car rolls down the slope with its engine switched off. Okay, no driving force. At point Y, the car has moved through a vertical height of 30 and has a speed of 11. What is the energy dissipated by the friction forces? Okay, so basically, the change in GP resulted in gain in KE and some work done against friction. Got it? So the change in GP is mgh, the gain in K is half mv square, and there's some work done against fric. So work done against friction is equal to mgh minus half mv square, or basically 500 into 9.81 into 30 minus half into 500 into 11 square. Let's do this. Eleven six nine zero zero, okay, or it's one two three four five one point one six into ten power five or one point two into ten power five. Eighteen is in fact B. Nineteen. Which expression cannot be used to calculate power? Okay, uh, we do know that power is F V. It is also the work done by time, and work done can be written as force into displacement by time. So actually D is wrong. It doesn't make any sense. Nineteen D is wrong. Twenty. The stress in a material is given by the equation shown. The strain is given by this, which gives the Young modulus. So Young modulus is actually the stress by strain, epsilon. Sigma by epsilon, okay? So it's actually force by area divided by extension by original length or after reciprocal, FL by AE. Okay, FL by AE, remember that. FL by AX over here. So, let's see. A is wrong, it has been inverted. B is wrong, it's not right. It should be FL by AX. Let's try C. Sigma is force by area, and we have X by L. FX by L, this is still wrong. What about D? F by A into... Um, you know, epsilon, that's x by l. After reciprocal, we get fl by ax. This is fine. d is good. Okay, we're done with half. Moving on to 21. This was actually an easy an easy variant, right? So 21. Um, what is an example of plastic deformation? A rubber ball is momentarily compressed every, every time it hits the ground. It comes back to its original position, so it is not plastic deformation. 
A spoon stirring some coffee in a ceramic mug hits its surface and makes a clinking sound. Uh, the shape of the coffee, uh, the shape of the ceramic mug does not change. Okay. A toolbox is left on a horizontal plank. When the toolbox is removed, the plank is no longer straight. It does not come. It was initially like this. After you kept the toolbox, the plank becomes like this due to the weight. Okay. As a result, it does not come back to its original position. Plastic deformation has occurred. 22. A transverse progressive wave of wavelength lambda is set up on a stretched string. The graph shows the variation of displacement y with distance x at a particular instant in time. The wave has displacement of plus y1 at distance x equals to lambda by 8. Where the next two values of x were displacement is equal to plus y1. Okay. Next two, right? So basically here and here. Okay. So as you know, this graph is symmetrical. Do you get what that means? Since this is a distance of lambda by 8 from 0, it's going to be a distance of lambda by 8 from lambda by 2. So the first one will be lambda by 2 minus lambda by 8. Try doing that. 1 by 2 minus 1 by 8. That is 3 lambda by 8. This is our first one, 3 lambda by 8. Let's go to the next one, okay? Since it's symmetrical, it's going to be a distance of lambda by 8 from lambda. Lambda plus lambda by 8, 1 by 8 plus 1, that's 9 lambda by 8, okay? So, 3 lambda by 8 and 9 lambda by 8. 22 is, in fact, B. 23. The graph shows the variation with time of the displacement of an air particle as a progressive sound wave passes through the air. The speed of sound in air is 330 meters per second. What is the wavelength of the wave? Okay, so from here to here, the time period is 20 milliseconds. Frequency is 1 by time period, 1 by 20 into 10 to the power minus 3. Hmm, 50, 50 hertz. Now we know that V is equal to F lambda, 330 is equal to 50 into lambda. Okay, 330 by 50 is 6.6, .6. so 23 should be A. 24. A microphone is connected to a CRO. A sound wave of constant frequency is detected by the microphone. What is the frequency? So, let's see. There are four divisions, right? Time period equals to 4 into 1 or 4 milliseconds. So, frequency is equal to 1 by time period. Frequency is 1 divided by 4 into 10 to the power minus 3. Try and doing that. 250. 24A. A train's whistle is emitting sound of frequency 500 hertz as the train moves with a speed of 20 along a straight track. The train moves directly towards the station observer standing next to the track and then passes the observer. The speed of sound in air is 330 meters per second. What is the difference between the frequencies of the sound heard by the observer before and after the train has passed the observer? This is a very common question. I've been seeing it a lot, okay? So, when the train approaches, frequency increases. When it leaves, frequency decreases, okay? So let's find out the two, two scenarios. One of them is the maximum one. That's going to be 500 into 330, speed of the wave, divided by 330 minus 20. The other one will be F minimum is equal to 500 into 330, divided by 330 plus 20. Okay, so 471 and 532, subtract those. If you subtract these two, 532 minus 471, we're getting a value of 61. Okay, so 25 should be D. Increasing wavelength, GX, UV, I, M, R. This is increasing wavelength or decreasing frequency. So, Microwaves have the highest, so this is wrong. Gamma ray, X ray, visible micro. B looks so good. 26 is B. Moving on to 27. To produce a station wave, two waves must travel in opposite directions through the same space. Which statement of the properties of the two waves must also be correct? They must have equal frequencies but different speeds and wavelength. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. This should be same. The waves must have equal speeds but different wavelengths and frequencies. Wrong. 
the waves must have equal speeds, frequencies, and wavelength. This is perfect, okay? 28. The speed of sound in air is this. Which size of architectural features in a large concert hall would best diffract the sound waves of frequency? This. Okay. So, basically, best diffraction occurs when the wavelength is compared, is uh, relatively comparable to the, the wavelength is comparable to the uh, width of the slits or gaps, okay? So, V is equal to F lambda. 330 is equal to 0 0.44 into 10 to the power 3 into lambda. Okay, we're getting a value of 0 0.75 meters. So, your goal is to look for the closest one. This is not close at all. 1.3 into 10 to the power minus 3 is 0 0.0013, I'm guessing. Yeah. 750 millimeters is like 0.75 meters. So that's perfect. Yeah. 28 is B. A double slit interference pattern using red light of wavelength 7 to 10 power minus 7 meters has a fringe spacing of 3.5. Which fringe spacing would be observed for the same arrangement of apparatus but using blue light of wavelength 450 nanometers, 4.5 into 10 power minus 7. Okay. So this is how you do the sum. First, use red light. Okay x is equal to lambda d by the formula for double slit interference so 3.5 into 10 power minus 3 is equal to 7 into 10 power minus 7 into d by a we don't know those values okay we haven't been given information but i am going to find an expression for d by a i'm just going to keep it like this now moving on to blue light x equals to lambda d by a x equals to 4.5 into 10 power minus 7 into d by a i'm going to substitute this back here and we're going to get 4.5 into 10 to the power minus 7 into 3.5 into 10 power minus 3 divided by 7 into 10 to the power minus 7. That gives us a value of 2.25 into 10 to the power minus 3. Okay, so yeah, uh, this is in meters. So after we convert it, it's going to be 2.3 millimeters. That's why we're going to go with A. 29 is A. That's the answer. Moving on to 30. A beam of light of a single wavelength is instant normally on a diffraction grading. The angle of diffraction theta is measured for each order of diffraction, n. The distance between adjacent slits in the diffraction grading is d. A graph is plotted to determine the wavelength of the light. Which graph should be plotted and how is the wavelength determined from the graph? Okay. So let's see. We know that d sine theta is equal to n lambda, right? So let's look at option a. They want the y-axis to be n and the x-axis to be d sine theta. So the gradient will be n by d sine theta. Okay. Now the wavelength is the gradient apparently. Okay. Let's see if that makes sense. d sine theta is equal to n lambda. Lambda is equal to d sine theta by n. Not really. It has been inverted. 30 isn't right. Let's look at 30a isn't right. B n y axis d sine theta x axis okay gradient is n by d sine theta now the wavelength is 1 by gradient okay we know that the wavelength is d sine theta by n so if we use 1 by gradient what do we get d sine theta by n that actually matches out so 30 is b okay moving on to the last section of the video questions 31 to 40 so yes uh, these are from electric fields we don't have them anymore you can exclude these um, directly going to 33. A wire has length 12 centimeters and contains a total of 5.1 into 10 power 22 free electrons. When a potential difference is applied across the ends of the wire, the free electrons move with an average drift speed of 4 into 10 power minus 6. Okay. I is equal to NAVQ. I is equal to... Ah, I see. So, we don't have the number density given. But we have the number of free electrons. Okay, we don't have the volume, right? I mean, we don't have the number density or the number of charge carriers per unit volume. Rather than that, they have given us the total number of free electrons. Okay. So let's see how to do this. It's a bit different from the typical ones. So, the derivation goes like this. 
we know that it's q is equal to i t right this is the conductor this is the cross section area the length is 12 centimeters we know the speed so n represents the number of charge carriers per unit volume okay so we know that volume is equal to area into length okay so if you actually multiply if you want to find out the total charge that's going to be the number density of charge carriers into the volume that gives us the charge and if you multiply by Q that's the charge of one charge carrier so these are the total number of charge carriers multiplied by Q that gives us the you know the total charge and we also know that Q is equal to IT right so this can be equated with IT and I is equal to N into AL into Q divided by T okay and we also know that I is equal to N into AQ divided by into L by T and that is the drift velocity so I is equal to N AQ V that's how we derive it actually so let's work with the information that we have we are asked to find out the current in the wire we can actually approach this in multiple ways I'm just thinking of the ways that we can do this we already have the number of free electrons basically this we already have this value n into l is the number of free electrons do you understand so we can actually find out q easily because this value is known n into l is known at 5.1 into 10 to the power 22 and to find out the charge we multiply this with 1.60 into 10 to the power minus 19 that is our total charge q is equal to it okay now we need to find out time because it is equal to this 5.1 into 10 to the power 22 so what if you want to find out current current will be 5.1 into 10 to the power 22 into 1.60 into 10 to the power minus 19 divided by the time so what's the time we know that s is equal to vt right now the length is 0 0.12 and the velocity is 4 into 10 to the power minus 6 and the time taken is this so 4 into 10 to the power minus 6 0 0.12 divided by answer we get a value of 30,000 okay seconds so I'm just gonna substitute that T over here 30,000 so 5.1 into 10 power 22 into 1.6 into 10 power minus 19 divided by 30k that gives me a value of 0 0.272 I, I'm going with C and that's the 33 is C so there are other ways to do this I just uh, show you what I prefer okay there are other ways you can do it in other ways it's fine now 34 a battery is marked at 9 volts what does this mean remember that voltage is the work done per unit charge so there should be a relation with per coulomb of charge okay so look at a each coulomb of charge from the battery supplies nine joules of electric energy to the whole circuit yes um, this sector refers to the whole circuit refers to the internal resistor as well as the external resistor so a is correct the battery supplies nine joules of electric energy to an external circuit this is wrong because what's the guarantee that all of it will go to the external circuit some of it may be lost inside the battery right 35 the diagram shows a circuit containing two batteries you need to check the polarity plus it's connected to plus that means something's fishy it's not corrected properly to get the emf you need to subtract 12 minus 8 if it was connected with plus and minus then we'd be adding it okay that's 4 now let's find out the correct current we know that v is equal to ir right so 4 is equal to i into 0.5 plus 1 so 1 plus 0.5 4 by answer 
So current is a value of 8 by 3 which is 2.67 understood. So 35 is A. 36. The circuit shown includes a self constant internal resistance and an external resistor R. A string records the emitter and voltmeter readings. She then connects a second identical external resistor in parallel with the first. Okay, guys, hear me out. This is identical, it has a resistance of R. When you do this, do you know what's going to happen? If two resistors are connected in parallel, Basically, if it was R initially, okay, I'm going to show you two cases. If you connect them in series, right? So, it becomes doubled. And if you connect it in parallel, it becomes halved. So, resistance is now halved in the circuit. So, when circuit resistance decreases, do you know what happens to current? When circuit resistance decreases, current increases, okay? current must increase now here's the thing when current increases loss volts increases this will take up more volts so there will be less volts available for the external resistors so voltmeter reading should decrease 36 is c 37 a battery of electromotive for c and negligible internal resistance is connected to four resistors r1 r2 r3 and r4 the currents i1 and i2 are shown which equation is correct Basically, according to Kirchhoff's second law and first law, basically we're going to use those. This is a parallel circuit. Do you guys get it? So, the voltage in these, basically in these two combined will be E and the voltage in these two combined will also be E because this is a parallel circuit. Do you get it? So, we can say that I1 R1 plus I1 R2 is equal to I2 R3 plus I2 R4. This is the logic basically or i1 r1 plus r2 is equal to i2 r3 plus r4 if we bring them on one side i1 r1 plus r2 minus i2 r3 plus r4 is equal to zero what does this match with uh, it's actually a 37 is b right okay 38 in the circuit shown a potential meter of total resistance 120 ohms is connected in parallel with a resistor of resistance 150 ohms and a resistor of resistance r the battery has electromotive force 12 volts and a negligible internal resistance. The voltmeter reads zero when the potentiometer, when the slider of the potentiometer is one fourth of the way from its lower end. This is quite interesting. What does this mean? Since it reads zero, there is no potential drop. That means the green section that is shaded actually takes up the same voltage as resistor R. Now, you guys need to understand something. This is a parallel circuit, right? This one will get 12 volts and these two combined will get 12 volts. So let's actually find out how much is this shaded section getting. It's one fourth of 120 ohms, right? So that's actually, um, you know, it's 30 ohms. So since it's gonna get 12, the whole thing is gonna get 12, how much will this section get? That's 1 by 4 into 12, so it's getting 3 volts. This section is getting 3 volts. So R must also be getting 3 volts, right? So now I'm going to apply potential divider. R divided by R plus 150. These two are in series, right? So the same current is flowing through them. So R divided by R plus 150, right? Into 12 is equal to 3. That's the logic. So 12R is equal to 3R plus 450 okay 9 r is equal to 450 450 by 9 that's r is a value of 50 50 ohms so yeah i'm gonna go with c 38 c is the answer last two a beam of alpha particles is incident on a thin gold foil one alpha particle collides head-on with the gold nucleus and is deflected back along its original path which statement could explain why the recall speed of the gold nucleus is small compared with the recall speed of the alpha particle momentum has to be conserved Do you guys get it the alpha particle is very miniature compared to the size of the nucleus okay so it's about momentum and uh, you guys know that you know a cannonball or a bullet when it leaves the bullet has high middle velocity but the recoil velocity of the gun is very low why the mass of the gun is higher that's why 39 should be c okay momentum should be conserved a hadron is composed of three quarks what is the possible composition of the hadron the hadron has a charge okay so down down up minus one by three minus one by three plus two by three that's zero 40 a is wrong 
now down up and strange for this what do you guys need you guys need this basically wait up let me get it for you you need to memorize this list okay then everything will be all right so strange is also minus one by three minus one by three plus two by three minus one by three also zero c plus two by three minus one by three minus one by three that's zero d plus two by three plus two by three minus one by three that gives us a value of plus one so d is our answer okay guys that's it i'm completely done with the 2021 series uh, so i'm gonna do the specimen paper 2022 paper one before your exam and i think i'm gonna do 2020 physics 2020 and chemistry 2020 after this right after i'm done with bio paper one 2021 okay so i'm going to link the playlist for paper one up here and i'm gonna link may june 2021 variant one one here and may june 2021 variant one three here and remember to subscribe sorry variant one two right variant one two over here and remember to subscribe to the channel if you like the video see you guys in the next one